Say his name. 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 What you say his name. It is a long piece, but it is a sobering piece. And I always like to play the entire piece because every time we think it's a little too long, I just want to remind us that that is not an exhaustive list. So as we prepare to have a few words about Holy Interruptions is the title of my brief lecture today, Holy Interruptions, Black Lives, Faith, and Mediating Proclamations. Black Lives, Faith, and Mediating Proclamations. When having conversations about Black public theology, 
It becomes significant to remember that Black theology is a part of the religious beliefs and practices of Black people. It is a diverse and eclectic conversation, and therefore Black public theology is more accurately Black theologies, and it is practical. And as it is practical, it takes shape from the places where Black life exists and moves about in the world, even if we do not want to recognize these places. It is multi-religious, it is Black queer life, it is Black women's life, and it is global Black life. Therefore, proclaimers and proclamations that live up to their accountability to these experiences respond to and out of the multiplicity of Black experiences, not just one Black experience. And part of that response includes, at minimum, recognizing the limits or boundaries of our engagement with Black lived experiences. And as a part of that ownership, as I enter this conversation about preaching, proclamation, and Black lived experiences for public theology, I am most concerned in these few moments about the ways in which historically Black Christian pulpit discourses in North America continues to shape or neglect the realities of Black life on the ground. I am also concerned with how we might enter into work that mediates some of the gaps we experience and witness on a daily basis. So we're naming a gap, but more importantly, how do we mediate those gaps? So let me say a word about preaching the headlines. In 2012, I developed a course called Preaching the Headlines um, that Dr. Clark mentioned as another forthcoming book, in part because it put people in the seats, right? It just sounds like a jazzy title. (laughs) However, the one aim and goal of that course is to think seriously about the responsibility of religious discourses as they intersect with public and social discourses. There often exists a divide between when we try to interpret the everyday world as a matter of faith Mm -hmm. and try to interpret faith as something that connects to the everyday world. So a word about the headlines of Black life. In 2013, we saw the rise of the hashtag Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Dr. Lord, for not a better setup. And by the fall of 2017, we saw the rise of the hashtag Me Too. Although its inception came in 2006, long before its climb to the forefront of the media. In between both of these hashtags were the cries of Say Her Name, a part of the campaign of the African American Policy Forum. All three of these monikers were not just pithy sayings or social media capital and tags or signifiers of woke status. But instead, the hashtags claimed a particular type of shorthand for the violence and invisibility rendered to black bodies in our world as these violent acts intersect with the historical, social, economic, and racial plight of the Black labyrinth in North America, as Anthony Penn calls it, and beyond. In short, the undervaluing and disregard for Black life leads to grotesque treatment of Black folk. And we have witnessed the ignoring of such atrocities being called to task as the literal threats to the ongoing well-being and health of Black communities and it's being dragged in the spotlight. And to be clear, the creators of these movements, including those who are identified as black, woman, queer, and immigrant, even as the hashtags and movements were quickly co-opted by black men and white wealthy women of Hollywood. At their inception, the movements were never intended to exclude the well-being or thriving of black women, black children, or black queer folk. Black Lives Matter, say her name, Me Too, and even their attempted co-optation underscore both the threats of black well-being and the sin of systems that afford black life to constantly hang in the balance at the discretion of others. But what has been most intriguing, but not surprising, for me to watch over the last six years is the fact that faith communities were not at the forefront of these movements. And or when we did join the movements, our actions were often met with suspicion. And we have to be honest about the fact that the suspicion which which we have been met or our silences are due to our own faults. And even those of us in the academy, because we have often harbored knowingly or unknowingly sentiments that do not value the full tapestry of black life as it exists in the world. The polluted air of white racism, patriarchy, ableism, and homophobia are equal opportunities employers to us all. Therefore, when we do value 
and say that our black bodies are created in the image of God, we have often said some bodies are created more equal in God's image than others. As we seek to attend to matters of public well-being for black people and the collective black body politic, we have to work to remedy what plagues us in our own houses of worship and how we mediate proclamations that attend to black life. For these are connected entities, not separate entities. We have to determine if we are going, if we are are or not going to take seriously the claim that the gospel promises are no less than life abundant and life abundant for everyone, as in thriving and well-being. There is no way around it. We're either going to believe it and do what is required of it and its fullest possibilities, or we are not. The question that begs to be answered is how does our religious rhetoric and discourse reinforce or disrupt death dealing assumptions around black personhood in particular? In short, Me Too, Say Your Name, and Black Lives Matter call the pulpit to a faith filled responsibility that attends to the deepest ills of our society and its best practices in faith communities call the world to task about its crimes about against the creation of God, including black creation. However, before we as faith communities can move forward or outward to do this work, I say that we have to look inward to the places where we ourselves have stumbled on the most major claims of the gospel. We must look inward to the places where we discredit the belonging, credibility, and personhood of black folk on a regular basis, including black womanhood, black queer existence, and black children existence, not just the existence of black heterosexual cisgender men that thing that has promoted that masculine toxicity. So let me say a word about here about the task of proclamation as it remains accountable to contemporary communities and context. This is a significant conversation due to the heightened awareness in our current times to the social and political landscape and the multiple concerns arising on local, national, and global levels. There is a constant barrage of messaging through newspaper headlines, social media feeds, and media broadcasting that make it both difficult to ignore the public domain and causes one to grapple with how religious and faith communities are to faithfully engage in public discourse. And in fact, more than engage in the discourse, but become viable participants in this discourse. This wrestling involves considering the connection of sacred speech to its contemporary context And to be sure, the quest of faithful responses and social engagement is not a question of faith communities isolated to the 21st century, nor a new set of questions. And yet every century and every era brings with it a unique convergence of circumstances that are connected to that time and that place right there. And to this end, there is a way in which the work of proclamation remains both consistent across time and also has different textures and shapes across time. My question today involves exploring the nature and ends of utterances that are faithful to the theological and ethical aims of proclamation itself, which I will say more about, while they are also accountable to the everyday life of Black bodily existence. In short, I contend that sacred speech or sacred utterances, which I will use as synonymous with proclamation, is more than words. And sacred speech intonates towards recovering or collected up fragmented experiences for the sake of wholeness, the wholeness of both individual persons and the entire community. This wholeness includes the integration of bodily and spiritual experiences in ways that are in opposition to the bifurcation or separatist understandings of body and and spirit that have long played the lives of Black folk in North America. In other words, the everyday reality of what it means to be human and move about in this world is of paramount importance and cannot be disentangled from religious belief and practices, not even the work of sacred speech itself. Instead, authentic proclamations recognize the connection and recovery of the body in religious experience, belief, and practice, and its outcomes have an effect or at minimum intersects with how one moves about or exists in the world. So we're gonna do this through exploring preacher prototypes or proclaimer prototypes is what I like to call them. And their work of recovering the body and the spirit and the everyday lived experience of folks. So I offer two proclaimer prototypes. 
Um, The first is the mortal in the book of Ezekiel, as presented in chapter 37 of Christian scriptures, First Testament, in the account of the Valley of the Dry Bones. And alongside of the mortal, I invite us to consider the spiritualist proclaimer, Baby Sucks Holy, from Toni Morrison's 1987 novel, Beloved, as she inhabits an open meadow as her pulpit. I choose these two preacher prototypes, both for the roles they fulfilled in their communities, the nature and texture of their messages, and the effect or implied effect of their utterances on life on the ground. These two prototypes and the nature of their proclamation create space for considering sacred speech and its work as it arises in contemporary context today, and often in uncharacteristic and non-traditional locales. No pulpits, no podiums. So I'm going to say a word here about proclamation and what I mean by this. Proclamation is a marking experience. It is a revelatory occasion, and its presence makes an inscription upon that which it encounters. Proclamation renders marks upon our existence in both describable and indescribable ways. It poses, it possesses a type of elusive yet qualitative essence. If we were to consider moments in which proclamation occur, be it from our words, deeds, or expression, we might describe it as something affirmed or recognizable by those gathered. In other words, we know it when we experience it, right? We get that amen, that's it, right there, I see it. These are utterances, moments in time that are often fleeting experiences and yet significantly meaningful to a person or the collective and often both. When we encounter proclamation or it encounters us, we often deem that something meaningful or significant has occurred, has been experienced. Proclamation has an effect. It makes way for an experience as it generates and conjures forth something more. For instance, authentic proclamation is not a description of pain or faith and hope, but somehow in the moment, even though it's elusive or they are elusive, we have an encounter with faith and hope. In this regard, proclamation is hard to describe, but when we know it, we experience it. It is a a meaningful utterance that has the capacity to ring ring clear and true right here and right now. A meaningful utterance that has the capacity to ring true and clear right here and right now. It often pops up in unexpected places, does not wait its turn to be heard or recognized. It often interrupts us in ways that are quite holy and interrupt and reorient us, even if it makes us uncomfortable, as it comes and discovers us right where we are. For if it waited to be recognized, we would never recognize it. If we waited its turn, or if it waited its turn, we would never give it a chance to take the stage. One's ability to ascribe meaningful and significant speech um, around an encounter is held within and shaped by our wider communal context. It's a communal discerning, a process of communally discerning, right? And it cannot escape grounding in context and the realities of those contexts. If it must be recognized, it must come in the right packaging, When experienced, proclamation is an encounter meaningful enough to be accepted as valid or true, and as far as it aligns with what one affirms, wishes to affirm, or is synergistic with lived experience. I'll repeat that. When experienced, proclamation is an encounter meaningful enough to be accepted as valid and true. In some of our traditions, we call it word of God. And in its noteworthiness or recognition, proclamation reconfigures borders and boundaries in the lives of individuals and their communities based on new and realigned understandings. This reconfiguration may take place in the form of affirmation of existing beliefs and experiences and or by encouraging practices that further shape the continuation of those beliefs and experiences. It may affirm it may correct or it may push. Mm -hmm. 
For communities of faith, proclamation possesses the nature of something more, namely the ripples of sacred inbreaking. The moment of proclamation may take the form of robust vibrations or simple ripples that realign or reimprint in the most subtle of ways, like a whisper. Whether it is a grandiose appearance or a hushed voice, proclamation is the moment in which the mundane has made way for what is holy, sacred, and counted as true to appear in our gathered midst. That which is familiar is made use of in often imaginative ways to disclose or unveil the unfamiliar or yet to be imagined futures or name what has eluded being named. The community recognizes or bears witness to the moment of proclamation when it occurs, as it has the characteristic of that which rings clear and truth. Proclamation relies on a call and response. There was something that went out and something affirms it and responds back, yes and amen, that's it. The proclaimer, the proclaimer relies on a type of imaginative precision that affords listeners and perceivers the opportunity to respond with, that's it. That's it for us today. In proclamation, there is a calling out that occurs, but the act is only complete when the entire community says, that's it. From the centers to the margins must say, that's it from the margins to the center must say, that's it. Proclamations of healing that mediate black life. So if we think about this framework of proclamation, then what does it mean for proclamations of healing that then mediate the gap between black life and faith? If proclamation is for the sake of life, then today we peer through time to consider both the characteristics of proclamation and think anew about the possibilities of recognizing proclamation as it bubbles up in non-traditional spaces and in non-traditional ways. Particularly those occurrences that attend to the realities of black life in ways that resonate with what we know, that we know that we know, to be true about it, what it means to be black and move about in this world. Say her name, say his name. I'm gonna start with our first proclaimer prototype. Baby Sucks Holy from Beloved. Beloved draws upon the history of blacks in the United States and their personal lives amidst the struggles of being an enslaved or once enslaved people in the novel. When Morrison shapes the narratives through the voices, visions, and memories, which she calls rememory, particularly of her female protagonist, the reader experiences the complexity of what existing as a community entails, struggling for well being in the midst of context to deny your very being. The opportunity for well being in the midst of everything that denies it is the opportunity for healing and the miraculous, right? So in you, if you are in a context that denies your very being, then proclamation or something that comes forth that affirms your well-being is the vehicle for the miraculous. It is the miraculous, unordinary thing or extraordinary thing. The preacher makes proclamation for the conditions that pervades the lives of her listeners. This preacher's baby sucks holy. Holy's listeners live in a world that does not value their flesh, thus rendering their bodies secondary and disposable. They are individuals who must figure out how to live with the tension of being objects of someone else's narratives and stories instead of the subjects of their own narratives and stories. As individuals that are objects, they are the objects with the narratives of white slave owners and the systems that support the institution, their bodies, emotions, and struggles are subjected or erased for the good and benefit of someone else when you're the object of someone else's story. The social and political order of the world has forced fragmentation upon the physical bodies before the preacher, baby sucks holy, as she prepares to proclaim. The fragmentation is a split between a self that acknowledges and expresses the breadth of its embodied capacity and a self that must compartmentalize and deny the full spectrum of their capacity. Morrison cast Baby Sucks Holy as the unassuming yet fully authoritative preacher and wisdom bearer within her community. 
She is scripted as one who draws the Black community of Ohio out into the clearing in the woods where she preaches. As she preaches from a huge flat rock, no pulpit proper, she invites the members of the community to experience the breadth and finitude, including their weakness and their strength. Through the words of Baby Sucks Holy, the listener envisions Black women as subjects and what it means to live and live fully of life and the Black community. At the height of her proclamation, Baby Sucks Holy declares a hermeneutic of what I like to call a hermeneutic of mediating. In the midst of constant assault, she declares, let the children come. Let your mothers hear you laugh. Let the grown men come. Let your wives and children see you dance. And to the women, she declares, cry. Just cry for the living and the dead. These phrases are simple. They are unassuming, yet in the world of Holy and her community, women are not afforded the vulnerability to weep for children that are bartered, sold, and traded as property. Children are not afforded the possibility and delight of play and laughter as they are filled hands, and men are removed from the movement and connectedness that comes to the rhythm of dance in Holy's community. In a world that forces bodily denial through violent and traumatic means, giving into the body and the vulnerability of its outward expressions are marks of fragility that threaten the survival of black flesh. And yet holy proclaims laugh, dance, cry. While echoing out that to be flesh that is black and thriving requires them to gather up the pieces that were forcibly scattered and attend to the body. That is restoration. Attend to your body that has been denied to you. Attend to both your body and your spirit that are one. Through her words, the preacher recovers the body, both in its significance and vulnerability. The preacher recovers the body, both in its significance and vulnerability. However, through her words, she also recovers the body's connectedness to the larger community. There is not one body that exists on its own, but bodies are existing one to another. In this community, even the proclaimer herself, a black woman, who at Zeus' strength does not carry the entire burden of the community's healing and thrively solely on her own shoulders. But instead, with the busted legs, as the narrative reads, back, head, eyes, hands, kidneys, womb, and tongue that slavery gave her, she's described as standing up with her twisted hip and dancing right alongside the other women, children, and men. This is not a go-it-alone motif of individuality. The preacher creates the space for personal burdens of joy to find a resting place within the connectedness of community. It is communal. And after Baby Sucks Holy's words of bidding and invitation, the narrator describes, without covering their eyes, the women let loose. And then it got all mixed up. And when it got all mixed up, the community comes to an end of something more. Women stopped crying and danced. Men sat down and cried. Children danced, women laughed, children cried until exhausted and riven, all and each lay about the, clam the clearing, damp and gasping for breath. In the clearing, a misworship and the sermon is a momentary inbreaking of a holistically integrated life, one in which the body is not incidental, but central to one's life and well being. And each body present right there in the clearing experienced sacred and breaking. Every single body. Not one was left out. The preacher does not shrink back, you know, when death is looming, but instead assumes the risky gap between a moment that ushers the fullness of life at the threshold of death waiting outside. So you have the fullness of life right here in the clearing as a possibility, yet death is always lurking at the edge of the clearing, waiting to creep in. And yet the preacher calls out life. The preacher calls out life and takes the risk to mend the gap. Ultimately, this is a simple yet complex and risky work of preaching. Somehow, Holy's Affirmation of flesh, 
and call to love Black flesh cannot be untangled from the recognition of the hate of Black flesh. You cannot call in life without acknowledging where death exists. In this understanding, her utterances attend to the presence of narratives and counter-narratives. In this community, proclamation occurs, physiological and psychological burdens are shared, the body is recovered, and the community enters in, and healing begins. I would argue life begins anew. And Holy ends by saying, here in this flesh, here in this place, we flesh, flesh that weeps, flesh that laughs, flesh that dance on bare feet and grass. Love it. Love it hard. Yonder they don't love your flesh. So that's Baby Sucks Holy. Our second preacher proclaimer prototype is Ezekiel, the mortal in the Valley of Dry Bones, so it's called. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, the reader is invited into yet another strange passage that is characteristic of the book. This is the book in which living creatures with wings and wheels within wheels turn and exist. There are time warps between valleys and whirlwinds sweep people to other places in time. In virtual reality, we find ourselves in this valley of dry bones with strange things happening. And in the real time, the bones are speaking in chapter 37. In real time, the bones are speaking. The bones are the house of Israel. The creator of God are saying, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off completely, dry, desolate exile. And it is to these bones that the mortal, the proclaimer, and the prophet is called to speak. Both the mortal and baby sugs holy are faced with the fragmented experiences between body and spirit. For the mortal, the fragmentation is a desolate valley of dislodged, disconnected, and broken bones. Some attached ligaments, but the absence of breath, symbolizing the full imprint of God in the house of Israel, the, the breath of God in the house of Israel in his exile. The mortal is trying to speak into the imitation of life. For baby sucks holy, there is the physical presence of body for which the social and political order of the world in which they exist has forced a type of fragmentation to occur. Two different kinds of exile, but no less exile. This fragmentation is a split between a true self that experiences the spectrum of human experience and a self that must compartmentalize and deny the full spectrum of human experience for the sake of survival. The presence of flesh that is not allowed to mourn, dance, celebrate, play, and laugh is ultimately denied in its full possession of the Imago Dei. And the mortal and baby sucks holy are contending with the presence of the imitation of life together in their communities, manifested in a fragmented existence. They are forced to face the task of calling forth life in ways that gather up and collect the lost pieces. But first, they each must name life. So let's take a look at Ezekiel 37, 7, and 8. The verses read, suddenly there is a noise, a rattling, and the bones come together, bone to bone. And the mortal looked again, and there is connective tissue on them, and flesh has come upon them, and skin has covered them, but there is no breath in them. As the mortal squints a little closer, he recognizes that even as the bones, the disconnected bones seem upright and connected, they are not yet alive. They can't breathe. The bones can't breathe. They are still cut off from an expanding spirit of life that has its beginning and end in God. Right here in the valley, it doesn't seem to matter how they got there, why they are there. It only matters that they can't breathe. And they are where they are. They are where they are without the ability to inhale deeply the life-giving breath that bears witness to God, the breath that rushes in from the uttermost parts of the earth and the cosmos. You can only say hope is lost if you have known the seeds of belief. You can only say you have been cut off if you know what it means to feel and sink and connect it. To say we can't breathe, our flesh is broken and flayed open, 
they don't love your flesh, we are cut off, is to say that we're experience, what we're experiencing is, is not what should be and should never be and is not all that it could be. It is not life-giving and affirming air that sustains wholeness, but instead tainted air that seeks to disembody and disconnect us. It is the air created by a world tainted with broken dreams, painful setbacks, discord, and the absence of harmonic rhythms. Tainted with a looming death penalty and no chance of parole. So we have Baby Sucks Holy and The Mortal side by side. And I'm convinced that today we know these echoes all too well ourselves. We will look forward to Black Lives Matter in a moment. But as we juxtaposition holy to the mortal, the mortal attempts to shrink back in human finitude is what I find fascinating. Baby Sucks Holy goes in and says, dance, weep, love your flesh. When the holy one tells the mortal to speak to the bones or can the bones live, the mortal says, only you know. Only you know. And that right before the mortal is placed the vision that cannot be not, be denied. And as if the Holy One says, now proclaim what you know that you know that you have seen. And in this moment, there is a bridging of the gap, the chance for the mortal to take the risk and bridge the gap and speak life and say, come wind and live bones. I also imagine this as kind of helping us envision the kind of divine and human exchange that takes place in proclamation and preaching on the ground wherever it shows up. There is a calling out and there is a response and there's an opportunity to participate in the creation and sustaining of life right here and right now. And the command is to speak nothing less than life. Don't stop until life actually manifests, not for just some, but all in the community. It is forging us forward in a vision of wholeness, a pursuit of wellness and the presence of chaos, not the absence of despair, but rather a specific state of being in, the, in our midst overall. The work of proclamation is to continually stir our imaginings to the eschatological echoes that breach our walls from time to time in the most unexpected locales and unexpected ways. Hell you talking about? Say her name. Say his name. Yes. So when we think about Black Lives Matter and its movement, I am encouraging us to think about alternative sites that are calling faith communities back to our task. These are the places that are actually speaking to the fragmentation of Black life and attempting to name where life should be, where it currently does not exist because of a fragmented existence that has been imposed on Black life. So when we hear Wonderlands is what we were listening to, hell you talking about, I hear the names, Sandra Bland, Emmett Till, right? They said that you didn't have a name, just that black body over there. But somehow there is a claiming of body and personhood by naming. And there's a claiming of the attempt to erase body and personhood by reinscribing body and personhood as something that is sacred and holy to be recognized and honored. And... Uh, I have, can I take one more minute to finish? Okay. We have, as we think about coats, so there were several things that emerged during the Black Lives Matter movement. We saw, see all these aesthetic pieces that pop up that do more work than sermons have ever done right here and right now because people recognize them as truth. It pushed forth something more. So just like we heard it in Monet's, Janelle Monet's and Wonderland's um, Hell You Talking About Mitch Sub, I want to think about coats. There's a section in ta Coates Between the World and Me where T Coates uh, talks about the threat to the reality of disembodiment and the erasure of Black bodies in North America. And there's a one way in which um, basically names the dismemberment and disregard for Black bodies. And then we have images of Brie Newsom climbing a flagpole. So just that these conjure alternative visions for our work and our lives here and now in the same way that we hope preaching will. And there's something that we can learn from these pull from these spaces that are pulpit less that teach us what our pulpits need to be doing and engaging. Somehow the work of black public theology and proclamations that mediate our existence here and now is the work of recovering body 
and spirit, black body and spirit in ways that uh, attest to the offer of life and no less than the offer of life abundant right here and right now. This means that proclamations and mediating proclamations for black life are proclamations that take risk, are messages that claim what no one else wants to claim, are messages that recover the entire community. And it cannot be word of God for us today if everyone cannot say yes and amen. Thank you. Thank you.